We rejoice and be glad for today the Lord has made part 4, chapter 34, Capital of the World. We continue with the reading of the Apostle by John Poet. Seeing a wreck, the native rushed to the shore. Unlike the Cornish wreckers of fable, in fact, they all, they all did fact. They did all they could to help. It had started raining again, and everybody was drenched from seawater, so the natives lit a great bonfire on the beach, and the ship's company began to dry out. The seamen had learned by now that this was Malta. The soaking had turned Luke rather Greek and superior. He dismissed the Maltese, even though they showed us little kindness as barbarians because of their dialect and thick accent. Though Malta had been Latinized for centuries, he was amused by their reaction to the next incident. Paul had sensibly warned himself and helped others' affairs by scavenging around, and despite his chain for brushwood wood to feed the fire, he threw on a bundle. One of his sticks leaped out at him and fastened to his hand. He had picked up a torpid, poisonous snake. When the natives saw the creature hanging from its, his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped the sea, Dussus has now allowed him allowed him to live. Paul, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They waited, expecting to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited long enough and saw misfortune came to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Paul had not panicked at the snake, and he was equal to the next call. In the neighborhood of the wreck was the Estate of Publius, the chief magistrate of Malta, who once offered temporary hospitality. The crew and most of the passengers were probably disposed around the hut's cottages of his people, while Julius, Paul, and their attendants were invited to the villa, where they discovered that Publius' father lay sick. It was not like, it was not Luke the physician, but Paul effected the cure. Paul visited him. Luke recorded generously. And after prayer, laid hands, hands upon him and healed him, whereupon the other sick people on the island came and were cured. Paul and Luke were only a few days at the chief magistrate's villa. Julius may have rented a house where the healing and evangelism continued all that winter. Luke and Archidus became greatly loved so that the people gave them many gifts and on their departure stocked them up with provision. Traditions in Malta marks Paul's stay at the beginning of an unbroken Christianity. The Maltese keep in memory the site of the wreck for the 18 centuries before Smith of Dunhill confirmed their legend was evidence. Another large grain ship from Alexander, sailing under the figurehead of the twin gods Castro and Pollux, had wintered in their nearby harbor. When early in 60, February 60, her captain decided to take advantage of fair weather to make a short run out onward to the sailing season and had not started Julius' passage, or had not started. Julius booked patches, passages. The village was uneventful, and at length Paul sailed into Bay of Naples, saw Mount Vesuvius and its lazy curl of smoke, and the city of Pompeii, unaware that nineteen years later she would be in ruins. The grain ship docked at Putiole, then chief port of the bay, where they found Christians. Julius permitted a week's visit as their guest whether because he had was not yet expected in Rome. He wished Paul to enjoy 
a last taste of comparative freedom, or because he had to send ahead to Rome for orders, or because he was simply in no hurry to bring the companionship of Paul to an end. When at last they set out to join Appian Way, Paul was a little nervous and depressed at what might lay ahead. Both before Nero and among the Christians of Rome to whom he had once written so joyfully and vigorously, even though they did not owe their faith to him. Forty-three miles out of Rome, at the town of Apai Forum, he met Roman Christians hurrying to welcome him. At Tres Tabernae, three taverns, a halting place thirty-three miles out, was yet another group. When Paul saw them, he thanked God <coughs> and took courage. Roman was at the greatest city Paul had ever seen. More than a million free citizens and about a million slaves lived on or between the seven hills, some of which boasted wide gardens, luxurious, luxur luxurious villas. Before Nero's palace on the Palatine, a large ornamental lake was being excavated for his pleasure. Where the Colosseum stands now, Paul had little opportunity to view the forum and great public buildings. After Julius handed over the prisoners to his superior officer, and the convicted fellows were taken off to be prepared for butchery by means of or another, by one means or another. Paul was placed in custody in a house rented at his own cost. It was not in an elaborate of narrow streets or in flimsy dwellings from which the mob emerged for periodical riot. It was not in the labyrinth of narrow streets from the, which the mob emerged for periodical riot. He would have had a home a reasonable size or small, but with a roomy garden just within the walls near the camp of the Praetorian Guard on the Caelian Hill in the north of the city. The rumble of traffic down the narrow cobbled streets at night when the country carts were allowed to bring produce to the markets, the babble of jostling pedestrians by day, the distant roars of excited crowds in the circus maximus during the chariot races or gladiatorial combats, the stench of a great city even in winter when Paul arrived, the risk of malaria in summer did not make for ease or luxury. And the regulations demanded the ever, never ending presence of a soldier to whom he must be changed. But he was not in prison. He could have friends at his side and invite all whom he wished. After three days, he sent for his local Jewish leaders and they came. Brothers, Paul said, Although I have done nothing against our people or the custom of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and would have set me free since they found me guilty of nothing, deserving the death penalty. But the Jews lodged an objection, and I was forced to, ap to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had any accusation, accusation to make against my own nation. That is why I asked to see you and talk with you, for it is on account of the hope of Israel that I wear this chain. The Jewish leaders could not tell whether Paul might receive the emperor's favor and protection, or at that period in Nero's reign they lacked influence. In the palace they were replied we have received no letters from Judea about you, nor any countryman of yours arrived here with any report or story or anything to discredit. We think it would be as well to hear your own account of your position. All we know about this sect is that opinion everywhere condemns of it, condemns them. Since many Ro Roman Christians were Jews at birth, by birth, the leaders knew more than they admitted. But Paul welcomed the opportunity for his noble sequence of preaching on arrival in any season to preach the gospel to the Jews first. 
On that appointed day, a considerable number came to his lodgings. <coughs> Paul expounded and debated from early morning until evening, testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them about Jesus, arguing from the law of Moses and the prophets. Some were convinced, others skeptical. When they left him, Paul quoted Isaiah to them, the text used by Jesus in which God rebuked Israel's self-imposed blindness. The heart of his nation has grown coarse. Their ears are dull, uh, dull of hearing, and they have shut their eyes for fear they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and be converted and be healed by me. Paul added, take notice, this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen, and the Jews left arguing vigorously. <laughs> Stubborn. That was the beginning of a period that, despite his sixty years, was as strenuous as any in Paul's life. He stayed there, wrote Luke in the final words of Acts, two full years at his own expense, with a welcome for all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and the facts about the Lord Jesus Christ quite openly and without hindrance. Luke's words are borne out by Paul's writings, I have made a servant of the church by God. He wrote from Rome, who gave me the task of fully proclaiming his message, which is a secret he hid through all past ages from mankind, but has now revealed to his people. For this is God's plan to make known his secret to his people, this rich and glorious secret which he has for all peoples. And the secret is this, Christ in you, which means you will share the glory of God. So we preach Christ to all. We warn and teach everyone with all possible wisdom in order to bring each one into God's presence as, an in, as a mature individual in union with Christ. To get this done, I toil and struggle, using the mighty strength that Christ supplies, which is at work in me. His day sped by in the same task as the Corinth or Ephesians, winning converts, building up teachers, evangelists who, who should go out to win and teach others. The church in Rome had already become numerous and vigorous. Whether or not Peter was already was there already, which by research of centuries had been unable to fix, was certainly. Yet there was many ancient hilltop cities in southern Italy waiting evangelists and great cities of the northern plains and villages of the Apennines. Furthermore, Rome was part of call for so many of every race and color in the Mediterranean world. It was a center part. And beyond that, Paul knew, never knew who might be brought to see him or to what distant land they might take past, take the message. And Romans, small and great, sought him out. Tradition has it that even Seneca, still powerful as a statesman and philosopher, corresponded with him, but their letters are a third century forgery and prove nothing. No one could leave that hired house untouched, if only to argue vigorously. It had an atmosphere of happiness, with the music and singing that Paul mentioned in both the chief letters he wrote from it. His character had not been soured or hardened by troubles. To judge by what he thought important, he was kind, tender-hearted, forgiving, just as Christ had, been for, had forgiven him. He walked in love, the element that bound his qualities together. He was still the great encourager, welcoming any who were weak in faith and refusing to argue about secondary matters. Romans learned that he lived as he had taught them when he wrote three years before, We are strong ought to be. We that are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. Like his master, he did not emphasize shortcomings but potential. 
He would not pass judgment on others unless they betrayed their master by open sin. When he could be severe, although always with this aim of restoring and strengthening. In that Roman house, bitter people softened anger, wrath, clamor, died away. Paul had more than ever a sense of his littleness and his unworthiness, less than the least of all saints. You know, the marvel of being entrusted with a commission to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. He seemed to delight in the contrast between the majesty of the message and the insignificance of the messenger. Such a gentle, low, little man now, yet with what steel and strength. The soldiers turn and turn about, knew what the, that strength had its chief contact with infinity. In the early mornings, the guard chained to Paul had no option but to join the time on his knees. And here the words of thanksgiving in intercession. Paul's heart was far away in Greece or Asia Minor. <coughs> Father of glory, the soldier must have heard him pray for the Ephesians and for the Colossians and for all who have not seen my faith. God of our Lord Jesus Christ, give them a spirit of wisdom, of revelation. May they know what is the hope to which you have called them. <clears throat> what are the riches of your righteous, of your glorious, of your glorious inheritance? What is the immeasurable greatness of your power? May they live a life worthy of you, fully pleasing to you, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in their knowledge of you. Father, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, according to your riches and glory, grant them to be strengthened by might in your inner man. May Christ dwell in their hearts by faith. May they be rooted and grounded in love and comprehend with all saints. <clears throat> what is the breadth and length and height and depth? And know the love of Christ. which passes knowledge, that they be filled with all your fullness, mentioning many by name, entering into their needs and problems. As best he knew, Paul prayed sometimes alone, except with a soldier, sometimes with Articus and Luke, and whoever was there with him, his prayers were shot through, the, through with praise. It may have been a soldier, whether Christian, and yet, or not, who first heard in Rome that thanksgiving would bring ring out to the world, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, all ages, without all ages, world without end. Amen. Old associates found their way to Paul. Joining Artias and Luke, the beloved Felician, one was John Mark, whose desertion in Pamphylia long ago had split Paul from Barnabas. Whether Mark had been in Rome with Simon Peter, had traveled from Cyprus or Alexander, Paul was completely reconciled and soon described him as a great comfort to me. Timothy Timothy was back at Paul's side. Tysias, too, who had been in Asia a delegate on the Jerusalem journey, another companion. Demas, probably a Macedonian from Thessalonica, would have a regrettable future. There was also a runaway slave in the household. Paul one day found himself confronted by the lost property of one of his close friends, the slave. Ominous, whose name means useful, had run away from Colossae in Asia, where he was owned by no, no less than Philemon, the mainspring of the Colossian church. Like many escaped slaves, 
one Simus had drifted to Rome, or Ephesus, other great cities of Asia, he might easily be recognized and hauled back to, to expect the usual fate, fearful fate of runaways. Whether one one of one of us is distressed or dead had sought out Paul or had been discovered by one of his companions, Paul brought him to birth in my imprisonment. He worked as Paul's servant and greatly endeared himself, so that Paul described him as my very heart. More than that, he became part of the missionary team, a faithful and beloved brother. The Ephrahas, the original missionary to Colossae, which Paul had never reached, arrived in Rome. He made Paul happy with excellent news of the Colossians' faith in Christ and, and love for their fellow Christians. But a few, but a heresy was troubling and puzzling them. Epirus, who felt intense desire that they should become mature and fully assured in the will of God, discussed the heresy with Paul at length. A great man of prayer, Epirus, wrestled in spirit and stirred others to pray for Colossae. Paul spoke of him as my fellow prisoner. And whether sharing voluntarily or under some sort of similar custody, Ephorus could not return to Asia. Paul determined to write to the Colossians and send the letter by Phastius. This would deal specifically with the Colossian problem, but Paul would send another more general letter that Phastius could deliver to the Ephesians for circulation among other churches in Asia, including cities Paul had not visited. Colossians and others' letters known as Ephesians and Bird similar to contact, yet distinctive in style. Thoughts much in Paul's mind are found in both, sometimes in identical phrases, so that it even possible that he composed the letters together, dictating part in part of one, then part of another, or may have written one and then adapted it for another, for other to Colossae with particular church in mind. He included personal messages while his message to the Ephesians is more formal, yet gives intimate autobiographical comments, especially when his mind was with those who had never seen him. Drawn out of the very depths of Paul's spiritual experience contained analogies, analogies between Christ's love for the church and a man's love for his wife, Ephesians have proved in mind for, for Christian mystics that no generation has exhausted, has exhausted both letters and striking sentences consistent with his earliest writings, yet with fresh touches as he worked over the themes from different angles, emphasized God's love, its purpose. To the Ephesians, he destined us in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we are redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespass according to riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. God who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He repented it. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not because of works, least any man should boast. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. To the Colossians, he poured out his same theme, but directed his teaching to answer their special problem. Heretics in Colossae were saying that they could not know God through Jesus Christ alone, but must recast and expand the message in the light of contemporary thought. They wanted to change the very image of God as Christ had revealed to him, to hammer out fresh terms to express his reality, to reach him by means more reasonable to those among whom they lived. Their theories were peculiar, similar in essence, essence 
though not in detail to the theological permits of the later 20th and 21st centuries. New Age Theophysies, yeah, yeah. Ascension and stuff, right, yeah. The words declare itself, keep them as they are, King James Version. Paul directed the Colossians, Christians firmly back, as therefore you receive Jesus, Christ Jesus, the Lord, so live in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in faith, just as you were taught, abiding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes, no one makes a prey of you by his philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, and not according to Christ. Paul was in no doubt whatsoever, Christ is the visible likeness of the invisible God. God created the whole universe through him and for him. He existed for all things in union. In union with him, all things have been, have their proper place. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the source of the body's life. He is the firstborn son who was raised from death in order that he alone might have the first place in all things. The only knowledge of God, the only road to God, whether on earth or in remote space, is through Jesus. In him all the fullness of God was pleased. That's the idea to you, Joel Osteen. There's not many ways. Only through Christ. In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace through the blood of the cross. On this foundation, Paul built exhortations and encouragement, urging the Ephesians, walk in love as Christ loved us, gave himself up for us. In the Colossians, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. You have put on the new nature, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, put on as God's chosen ones, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, patience. Both letters contain advice and direction, grounded in clear spiritual teaching, how a church should be guided and grow, how different members, including masters, and slaves, husbands and wives, fathers and children should best please God. When Paul closed his letters to the Colossians, he sent personal messages for peculiar, peculiar people and new friends of Rome. The letter to Ephesus, being a, for general circulation, could not close like that. To end it, he had a stroke of genius, which may have been actually suggested by one of his guards, and suddenly was provoked by his interest in the soldiers. He could often watch them performing drills on the fields outside the walls near the camp of the Praetorian Guard, and in his travel days had grown familiar with their service equipment. So now, checking with the soldier of the day, Paul created one of his famous passages, the Christian armor, which will enable him to stand his ground when he fights, when the fight is hottest. Deflect the arrows tipped with burning. Toe, an advice, wielding a trusty weapon. He went on to describe the belt around the loins, the iron breastplate, the sandals, the shield and helmet and sword. Take unto you the whole armor, armor of God, that you may be able to stand up and stand in the evil day. Having done well to stand, and stand there for all, having your loins girded about with truth, having the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherein you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, watching their run too with the perverence and supplication for all saints and full armor. My God, that was beautiful. Chapter 35 Shalom. 
I give you the peace of God. May that, the armor we can put on, that we put up our pity, just things that we have with the body of Christ and our arguments and our pride and our ego. We put on the full armor and we comfort one another and fight for glory. And we fight that battle as Paul has just given us for the glory of Christ. We hold him up. Shalom with the peace of this glorify you. Amen.